es un placer estar aquí y con mi boricua también. Eso es lo que llamamos, eso es nuestro term of endearment, porque el nombre original de nuestra isla es Borinquen. And Puerto Rico was a name that was imposed on us that actually meant Port of Riches, right? So you often don't hear other Boricuas call each other Boricuas, and that's um, reclaiming who we truly are. So what I wanted to start with first was showing you about an 18-minute short documentary that we made um, coming back from Puerto Rico. And I'll talk a little bit about the collective and how we got there. Um, because I think the missing conversation in all of this, especially for Puerto Ricans that are in the diaspora and not on the island, is to me this is all under the context of colonialism, right? So I say that we've been, by, we've been hit by hurricanes, but the biggest one is Hurricane America that colonized us and has kept us as their colonial subjects without us being able to self-determine our own faith on the island um, and, and really has had a devastating effect on the mentality of Puerto Ricans on the island and off the island. We call it the colonized mentality. And France Fanon spoke a lot about that. But having my mother and my father that were born in Puerto Rico and my abuela y abuela, we, we actually used to have some really good conversations because my abuela was an independista. And to be that um, carried a weight of a lot of state repression, including imprisonment, to assassination, right? But the thing about Puerto Rico that is often not talked about is the resistance of the people on our island, right? Whether it was Pedro Albizu Campos, whether it was Lolita Labron and other, um, and other Puerto Rican political prisoners. Puerto Rican political prisoners are the only ones that were ever charged with sedition conspiracy, which means to talk about overthrowing a government, right? And they spent collectively hundreds of years in jail, and it's just been two years that Oscar Lopez Rivera, who at that time before he got out, was the longest held United States political prisoner, and actually was held in more years than Nelson Mandela. Um, so, yeah, we have to talk about that, right? It can't just be like, the island is rebuilding because the people are doing the work. You know, and, and a mentality that I found in a lot of my cousins in Puerto Rico is that they would always say, what can we do? We, we can't be something without the American government. Hurricane Maria showed what we can do with the abject failure of the United States government, the agency of FEMA, and anybody connected with that so-called recovery. Because the people had to do everything and the people are still doing for self. And now, the last time I was there, I could kind of see, like, especially younger people who had also been waging a battle around austerity and a around saving the University of Puerto Rico system. Um, I see a lot of young people like, we don't need the United States. And what we're gonna hopefully see is more action coming through the United Nations, but other nations truly, truly supporting Puerto Rico to be on a path of decolonization independence. And as well, people like to talk about the debt of Puerto Rico. We do not owe America a dollar. They've extracted from us. They have used our people to experiment on us. They have used Vieques to bomb for over 67 years. We're part of what is known as the Southern Command. So Puerto Rico is very militarily important to the United States. But the idea that we owe $70 billion to some Wall Street hedge fund, no. We don't owe that. And we also have to have a discussion in Puerto Rico about reparations. What is the United States going to do for the 120 plus years that they have kept us a colony? They have taken from us, it's time for them to give back. The battle's gonna be long, but the people's mentality has already shifted towards independence. And you can see it in the new generation, and it's been incredibly exciting to see. Not only are our people resilient, but we deserve to thrive. This idea that Puerto Rican people are exceptionally resilient 
in one of the biggest climate catastrophes of this century does not give us the room to then thrive. If we're always having to survive, how do we thrive and build a nation? You know, so do I just play it? Yeah, right here. Es raro, la sensación es rara, es confusa. Se habló del huracán, pero de ahí a que dijeron que iba a ser algo más fuerte que Irma y que nos iba a soltar fuerte y que iba a atravesar la isla, fue como estrésico. People need to prepare themselves to be in solidarity with the struggle in Puerto Rico as the struggle in Puerto Rico develops. No podemos acceder a internet. Acá en este campo no hay redes. Te mueven de un lado, que tienes que hacer una querella con la policía y vas al cuartel y te dicen que no es necesario una querella, que vayas a FEMA, pero entonces tú vas a FEMA, dale el nombre, apuntarte en una lista, porque no hay, no hay nada más, no hay realmente acción. Que digan en realidad lo que está pasando en Puerto Rico. Y estamos sin luz y sin agua, ya vamos para tres semanas. Este es el pueblo de Puerto Rico que más barrio tiene, tiene 23 barrios. Y hay barrios que todavía no se ha podido llegar a ver cómo está la gente. Hay gente en los barrios que no ha recibido nada todavía. Esta máquina quedó entejada completamente en esos árboles. La reparamos, pero volvió se nos rompió aquí. Nos hemos tenido que hacer obligados porque aquí no ha venido nada de gobierno. Nosotros estamos sin gobierno. El gobierno dijo que venía una gran tormenta y que estaban preparados para todo. Porque están diciendo por allá que en Puerto Rico no ocurrió nada. Sí. Y no es la verdad. Puerto Rico es parte de los Estados Unidos. No hicimos esto a Katrina. No hicimos esto a Harvey. Shame on us. We need to do much better. So let me read to you what um, one of our nurses, Erin Carrero, said. Yesterday we went to Utuado, a town up in the center of the island. We stopped many times along the way to educate people on water safety. They have received no provisions. There is no running water, no electricity. Nobody is aware of the risk of drinking untreated water. <sighs> These communities are at great risk for waterborne illness epidemic. They need clean water that is safe to drink. These conditions would not be tolerated in any of the 50 states. It is outrageous that we are leaving our fellow Americans with essentially no aid more will die if we do not step up. Bueno, yo sinceramente he escuchado que lo que hay es cadáveres. Y he escuchado con, 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 con gente que de verdad pues, se pasan aquí, rondean aquí y sé que lo que hay ahí son cadáveres. Porque ahí no va a haber crimen, no va a haber ni pollo, ni chuleta, ni nada. Lo que hay son cadáveres. Han sido bien responsables en cuanto a manejar el, el manejo que llevan. The deaths the day of the hurricane are one thing. Every death after that, that has to do with not having the appropriate medical conditions, not having the appropriate sanitary conditions, not having the appropriate health conditions, not having the appropriate food or water intake. Those are deaths related to Maria. People here are starving. Some people have died from dehydration. People here are drinking contaminated water. We need tools to survive in the immediate sense. But we also 
need the support as we go through the process of demanding what we have a right to in this country. There is a problem with our drinking water. People are drinking from creeks or from rivers where the animals are dying. Uh, we already had some confirmed deaths of leptospirosis, uh, which usually you get when rats uh, urinate in places, but also when animals die in the same bodies of water that people are drinking from. We already have scabies and conjunctivitis and gastritis at alarming rates. Uh, and, and if you're not well hydrated and you don't have access to the appropriate medical attention, a gastritis can kill you. We still don't have the basics, uh, things that are essentially human rights. The United Nations say all humans should have access to drinking water. Que la gente nuestra la de, están dejando sufrir y, y no sé si es con un propósito porque todo el mundo sabe que hay ayudas aquí pero no llega a la gente que las necesita. Que cómo es posible que tengan almacenada el agua en montones de sitios aquí y no, y no la distribuyen, que no llegan la, la, las ayudas y los alimentos. Así que el asunto de, los, de la alimentación yo creo que es primordial. Estamos teniendo un problema también eh, con el agua. Hay brotes en nuestras comunidades, lo hemos visto. Eh, no solamente, ¿verdad?, quien lo hizo, pero tenemos presencia en comunidad. Ya hemos hecho más de 400 asesmes en las familias y hemos visto brotes de conjuntivitis, sarna humana. It's not like they saying, it's, it's not, we're not getting fixed. We're not getting power. I'm over here getting water for myself, my family, and neighbors. It's 55 gallons a piece. I cannot get no more. Try to come twice a day. Try to help as much people as I can. Right now I'm getting this water for, to clean and help the elderly in Villajoco, Puerto Rico. That's the town in Toalta. They got really ravaged. Right now they, they got a contagion of conjunctivitis and we have no medical supplies or anything. And about the conjunctivitis, yeah, I got it myself. That's why I know about it. That's why I'm keeping my glasses on. I don't want to spread it. I don't want to shake your hands. Don't believe the statistics. Don't believe what people are telling you. I have no agenda here. I'm a nurse. The CDC hasn't reached out to us to get any of our data. There should be a CDC camp right here debriefing nurses on the daily when we come home at night at 8 p.m. when we've been out since 6 and 7 o'clock in the morning. No one's asking us that data. To where should be, no one's come and said, what community do you think needs to be seen first tomorrow? It's not a lot of chlorox that you put on water. You, you put your head, you just add a few drops. Okay. A gallon of water, you could put like five drops of per gallon to preserve that water, to kill most of the bacteria, which it doesn't really take all of that away. In there, I put about a cap full, a little cap full of chlorox. In there, that's 55 gallons. That water is not safe. <laughs> but they're not supplying enough drinking water for people. In Puerto Rico, they have refined colonialism to such an extent that people have been taught to accept the inferiority of us as a people. Somehow, the Americans are more capable we need them to govern us. We need them to tell us what's best for us. Because we don't have the capacity to figure that out for ourselves. We don't have the capacity to join the international community and make our way the way every other nation has the capacity to do it. No podemos seguir permitiendo que nos aplasten así, de una manera tan descarada abusiva. Nosotros nos estábamos ayudando solo hasta que fuimos colonizados y no podemos idolatrar eso, no podemos idolatrar el abuso ni el maltrato, tenemos que idolatrarnos a nosotros, los que hemos mantenido esto vivo, porque yo creo que fácilmente pudiésemos ser otra cosa completamente y hay algo que todavía me pregunto eh, concretamente qué es, pero hay algo que definitivamente nos mantiene Hay algo latiendo ahí todavía en nosotros. Eh, hay que abrir camino y, y eventualmente reconstruir todo esto. 
Estamos sobreviviendo y sabemos que Puerto Rico siempre, el puertorriqueño, siempre echamos para adelante eh, y nos ayudamos siempre los unos a los otros. Y yo soy de las que creo que uno lucha en su, en, su, en su país, en su pueblo, que trata de ayudar, porque muy bien, uno tiene que quedarse en, en, en su país, tratar de luchar lo más que uno pueda para tratar de echarlo para adelante y tú sabes, y en esa estamos. Esta es La Olla Común. Este es un centro de comida, pero donde también nos apoyamos mutuamente. Pues no es un comedor social, porque las personas que vienen a comer no solamente vienen a comer, sino que también este, nos dicen sus destrezas. Nosotros vamos llamando, por ejemplo, si en la comunidad hace falta alguien que le ponga un techo, pues llamamos a las personas que dijeron que son carpinteros que vinieron a comer aquí. O sea que tenemos un registro de cada persona que viene a comer, porque el propósito es unir fuerza, ¿verdad? Porque nosotros son, no, nos, no nos separamos de la comunidad, sino que nosotros todos somos parte de esta comunidad también. Entonces, pues así nos ayudamos mutuamente. Que se escuche y que se vea y que se sienta que Puerto Rico se está levantando porque nosotros mismos nos estamos levantando, o sea, nos estamos ayudando mutuamente a levantarnos. Ningún gobierno nos está levantando a nosotros. Well, I think for young people, you know, the world is in your hands. I'm an old man, but the world and the future of it is in your hands. I'm gonna leave now? Right. After a crisis like that? Nah. nah. I prefer staying and helping people than going out and doing nothing. At least. That's my way of thinking. No, yo me planifico quedar. Este, precisamente por eso es que estamos haciendo lo que hacemos. No reciben agua, no reciben comida y ese es el problema mayor que hay, ¿entiendes? ¿Entiendes? Y ese es el desafío que estamos viviendo diariamente los puertorriqueños. Yo lo puedo resumir todo en esa palabra, crisis humanitaria, lo que se está viviendo en Puerto Rico. Ciertamente. I mean, like our indigenous brothers and sisters said, water is life, and that's what's needed right now, clean water. That's it. What does that mean? That means buying a water portable filtration system and bringing it on your own so it doesn't get sequestered at the port. It means connecting with community groups on the ground. That's number one, okay? And people have to understand that this entire water system is contaminated. After that, it's power and how we do power with solar, and how then do we have forms of communication that don't depend on a cell tower and food. Those are the immediate needs. Because the people of Puerto Rico cannot even function a daily, quote, normal life without the bare basic necessities. I wanted to do for everybody on this crew who's younger than me what elders have done for me in the past. I thought that it'd be critically important that I bring a group of younger, like Latino, Latina, Latinx, some Boricua, but all Latino folks together to document and um, tell the stories of really what was going on in Puerto Rico. And I think at first people were like, well, what film crew and what news organization? I was like, nah, we're making our own. We're PR on the map. Join all of our donors who support independent, unapologetic, unfiltered media by going to PROnTheMap.com, hashtag PROnTheMap on Twitter, and following us on Facebook. Donate, share these stories, and continue to learn more and uplift the rising up of Puerto Rico and the people of Puerto Rico.
sabor ingenio que han dado la señal. Despierta de ese sueño que es hora de luchar. A ese llamar patriótico no arde tu corazón. De no será simpático el ruido de cañón nosotros queremos la libertad nuestros machetes nos la darán vámonos por ingenios vámonos ya que nos espera ansiosa ansiosa la libertad national anthem, La Boriqueña, that's what we sing. And that second one is um, Que Bonita Bandera. You hear a lot, especially in New York City when we have our Puerto Rican parade, but also everywhere. And, um, you know, I, I, this is almost two years, you know, and we still have about 100 hours of footage, and we're working on a major documentary, hopefully to start filming in September for a couple of months in Puerto Rico and visiting everybody who's doing the work. Um, one of the organizations we partnered up with is Defend Puerto Rico. So now you might see the Puerto Rican flag as black, black and white, which signals distress. And that's why a lot of us are wear that. But um, Defend Puerto Rico has been doing what everyone else on the island is doing, you know, rebuilding self, like with the community, with the people. And Defend Puerto Rico actually, I think they're building their eighth house in Comodillo. Um, so I just want to do like a little quick timeline of how the colonialism works. Because like I said, you cannot talk about Puerto Rico unless you talk about the colonial condition. And in the United States, 57% of people do not know that Puerto Ricans are American citizens. You know, so. Um, that right there showed how when the hurricane happened, how disgusting the news media was here. All of them. Progressive, Del Mundo, Universal. I mean, like, I watched for five days before I went, right? And what it is often in the United States of America, we as Latino, Latina, Latinx folks are lumped into this like one amorphous grouping of people, right? Like, you know, I don't like to admit it, but I got people in my family that are Boricuas that voted for Donald Trump. Like, I don't like to say that, but it's true. And I just don't deal with them anymore, you know? But, you know, like, and also people have to understand how corrupt go Governor Jose Joe is. You know, I'm waiting for the investigations to finish against him, like the journalistic ones, so we will know exactly how corrupt he has been. Because I went to the press briefings they had every day, and he stood up there every day and lied about how many people died. 64. See, anybody who watched Katrina, I covered Hurricane Katrina, it took them four years of investigative journalism for the government to finally admit thousands of people had died. And what it is is that people think of the impact of the hurricane, right? That most people died there. No, most people do not die on the impact of a hurricane. It's the days and weeks 
that happen, where the water's contaminated, where people can't have their dialysis machine, people who have diabetes, people who were already unhealthy, you know? And luckily, Harvard did do that study that came out where Harvard has said it's 4,446. But Harvard only went to 27 municipalities, and there's 72, 73 municipalities in Puerto Rico. So now imagine when they finish the project. So my estimation is it's going to be eight to 10,000 people that died because of the hurricane, but because of the neglect of the United States government, right? And, and coupled with Jose Joe, right? Like, Trump going there throwing paper towels to me was not a surprise, you know, especially in the community they took him to, which is a very well-off, gated kind of community. They didn't take him to the streets like Santuce, Luisa, Utuado. They didn't go there, right? So I wasn't shocked at what a megalomaniac psychopath like Trump <laughs> is, why he would go there and throw paper towels. But... What was, I think, a little hurtful, right, is that then you have Jose Joe and people in New York who, sit, who are Boricuas but really don't care about the people, right? Like, they don't care. So I, I worked on this cartoon history of colonialism in Puerto Rico. I worked on it with someone to um, share it with my, uh, my daughter's school. She goes to a very progressive school. And their whole project this year was to do as much learning about Puerto Rico. And they left last Sunday to do service projects. So, and I'll go through it very quickly. On December 10, 1898, upon the signing of the Treaty of Paris, Spain ceded Puerto Rico along with the Philippines, Cuba, and Guam to the United States, thereby bringing the Spanish-American War to a close. What's interesting with that is that the sinking of the main really didn't happen the way they said, kind of like what's going on with Iran, like right now, right? That was their justification to go to war. The Four Acre Act of 1900, and the Downs v. Bidewell of 1901, one of the Supreme Court's so-called insular cases on territories acquired in Teddy Roosevelt's splendid little war, the U.S. established colonial rule over Puerto Rico. Downs and Bidewell decided by some of the same judges who had ruled on Pessy v. Ferguson, asserted that Puerto Rico belonged to the United States but was not subject to the protections of the United States Constitution. One of the most ways we see that is Puerto Ricans on the island cannot vote in a presidential election, all right? But the minute we migrate here, we can vote. You know, so you're talking millions of potentially democratic or more progressive, moderate, even leaning votes, but not, I would say, not too many Republicans, but we cannot vote if you live on the island. In 1917, three years after the Puerto Rican House of Delantes demanded independence, the Jones Act was conferred citizenship on all Puerto Ricans. So our citizenship was conferred, people never asked. And there were people at that time that were refusing to take American citizenship and try to fight back about that. But it also then made, Amer uh, particularly the men, subject to the military draft. And if you study all the wars, Puerto Ricans have a high number of casualties in proportion to the numbers that we are, right? It established the role of a resident commissioner who was a non-voting representative of Congress and exempted Puerto Rico bonds from federal, state, and local taxes. So, we have a representative in Congress. He's a shadow congressperson, or she. Um, and they are not allowed to vote on anything. They're allowed to go to certain hearings, but that's not full representation, right? The Merchant Marine Act of 1920 subjected the island to 
shipping laws that permanently raise the prices of goods shipped to the island by forcing all shipment by water in and out of Puerto Rico to be carried on U.S. flagships crewed by U.S. citizens. And this is why the prices, especially of automobiles, are very much higher in Puerto Rico. And you could even see during um, Hurricane Maria the number of countries that offered assistance and the U.S. government, because of the Jones Act, was like, no. Right, so Venezuela wanted to give oil. Cuba wanted to send 1,000 doctors. Um, other countries wanted to send food, aid, solar, and they were prevented from doing that. While we need, you know, and that's why a lot of people died. That's called organized crime. Yeah, I mean, who's running the White House? It is a criminal enterprise, so you're right about that. <laughs> in 1934, Harvard-educated nationalist leader Pedro Abisu Campos organized island-wide strikes by agricultural workers, which coalesced into a movement for independence from the United States. In 1936, he was arrested and imprisoned, and on March 21st, 1937, a march protesting his imprisonment was attacked by police, leaving 19 people dead. This is known as the Ponce Massacre. Also, Pedro Albizus Campos was, in his second arrest, he was put in uh, Atlanta Federal Prison here in the state, and his cell had a radiation light. The United States government has admitted this, and Bill Clinton actually apologized when he was president. They gave Albizus Campos cancer. They put a radiation light, and that's how he ended up dying. So you look up on the record, it has been admitted, and Bill Clinton did his little apology, but no way of like repairing or the damage or anything like that. Then in 1937, there was a law, um, that, a sterilization law that was favored by eugenists, like Clarence Gamble, was passed to address the issue of overpopulation in Puerto Rico. At various points during the next 40 years, Puerto Rican women had among the highest rates of sterilization in the world. Many of them did not know that. One third of the women of this time period were sterilized in Puerto Rico. And many did not know because they were also, Johnson & Johnson was testing IUDs and birth control and they weren't telling them. So they were also subjected to experimentation with untested birth control methods. As a response to the growing nationalist movement, the United States names the first Puerto Rican governor, Jesus Pinedo, in 1946. Under his administration, the gag law made it a crime to display a Puerto Rican flag, sing a patriotic song, speak or write about independence from the United States. That was in effect for 11 years. You could not fly the Puerto Rican flag in your house. You could not sing La Boricanya or anything. You couldn't write about independence for 11 years. And then what they then did, especially through the education pro process, is they implemented Americanization in the public schools. So everything was about Americans, saluting the American flag, speaking in English, hiding the history of African descendants on the islands, and all this kind of stuff. <coughs> In 1952, under Luis, oh, excuse me. <coughs> in 1952, under the territory's first democratically elected governor, Luis Munoz Marin, Puerto Rico drafted its own constitution <coughs> and created a euphemism for its colonial status. Free associated state. And that's still what people talk about. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> While the U.S. granted the new Commonwealth a considerable degree of autonomy, it also assured that the island would remain a U.S. colony until its economy improved enough for us to be free, which I never think was the intention. The creation of the new Commonwealth of Puerto Rico coincided with the up implementation of Operation Bootstrap, which transformed the island's agricultural economy into an industrial one. While Bootstrap 
improve living standards for many, it depended on the export of supplies, surplus labor to the United States. This is also when you see the second migration of many Puerto Ricans coming to the United States. My abuelo was one of those. Um, he, was, he worked in the fields, sugar cane. Uh, they would send like people from the United States, like, oh, don't you want to come? We have better jobs. They would put them on cargo planes. You can see pictures of them. Like, they didn't even put them in seats. They strapped them in, like, cargo. And then they stopped in cities. And the one that my abuelo got, got to was Pittsburgh. And then the United States people that were recruiting them for steel mill jobs would go, do you want to go to Pittsburgh or Youngstown, Ohio? And my abuelo went to Youngstown, Ohio. Very crazy thing is my... Abuelo and Abuela has 16 children, and they were all raised on one salary because of the steel mill. And I tell people that because then it kind of makes you understand, too, like what people in America are going through at the time as manufacturing starts to go down. I mean, I'm sure there's people in here who had one parent working who took care of all, everybody. And now you're like, you can have seven jobs and still not afford rent, you know? So... Um, but that's what they did, so that's when you see a second migration of Puerto Ricans. Most, though, end up in New York. That was also had a lot of manufacturing, Springfield, Massachusetts, Chicago, and some in Florida. Now, the people that are, I call it a forced exodus that's happening in Puerto Rico, um, the people that are leaving now are mostly ending up in Florida. First, it's closer. Second, Really, no one at this point can afford rent in New York City or Chicago. They have been so gentrified, and you know, 60% of your income if you live in New York City just goes to rent. So obviously, they're like, okay, Orlando, or Florida, or, or Miami. Now, this will be interesting in the 2020 election. There is an assumption that that many Puerto Ricans will vote Democrat. Right, which I'm, I'm an independent person, I'm a Green Party person, but that would be nice to see Florida go the way it should have gone. You know, but I've been working with people down there and I'm telling them, you can't just go up to Puerto Ricans that had to leave their home and are in post-traumatic stress and be like, you need to vote. You have to cultivate relationships. And I think what people are not talking enough is there's no Puerto Rican that has not been touched by what happened with Hurricane Maria, okay? There's not one person I met that has not been affected by that. And it's been less than two years, and the post-traumatic stress of living like that. Yesterday, the lights went out here, I heard. I was at an event, a transformer, something happened. And I was at this event, and there wasn't like electricity for an hour, and everybody was freaking out. I would say there were people in Puerto Rico that didn't have electricity for a year. And before that, there were already rolling blackouts because the grid was falling apart, right? So in Puerto Rico, sometimes the lights can go off again. But imagine, I was like, imagine that being in New York City in two days. There'd be a complete, like, chaos. But that didn't happen in Puerto Rico. That, that type of chaotic situation of where you're like, I don't have lights and it's been eight months. You know, so that even to me was like, yeah, that's what we do. Like, as Puerto Ricans, we figure out the way. Um, and in 1996, in an effort to reduce tax breaks, the United States, four United States corporations, President Clinton successfully lobbied Congress to end Section 936, which was phased out of a 10-year period. And in 2006, when 936 was fully phased out, the Puerto Rican economy, which had been in decline, went into recession. But also the 2008 recession here was the beginning of Puerto Rico's economic problems, right? Because then Puerto Rico has to start bar borrowing money from bonds, and how do you pay it back, and then you got to deal with Wall Street. And I tell people it's like when they put an emergency manager in, uh, in, in, in charge of Detroit, or Flint, or Gary, Indiana. You're seeing that a lot in the United States, where um, you have... Um, elected officials, but then they put in an emergency manager. And in Flint, it was that emergency manager that made them switch to the other water, which contaminated Flint. And to this day, Flint is still fully contaminated. 
okay? And then in 2010, following the austerity model pioneered by your illustrious governor, Scott Walker. <laughs> Ex, I know, where is he? And other conservatives. The governor of Puerto Rico at that time cut 20,000 government jobs, imposed a tuition increase on university students, prompting massive student and labor demonstrations that were cracked down so violently that the Puerto Rico Police Department, till this day, is under a Department of Justice investigation. And now there's another one because of what Puerto Rico police did on May Day last year when they completely attacked people who were protesting and actually also went into people's houses and were pulling them out to arrest them, right? So that's, you know, that's pretty much the timeline. And then in 2006, Obama signed PROMESA which is the bill that was supposed to restructure Puerto Rico's debt. Puerto Ricans here fought that all the way. Unfortunately, we have two Puerto Rican Congress people, Nidia Velasquez, Jose Serrano, and the illustrious Lin-Manuel Miranda of Hamilton, who went and said in testimony, we need to support PROMESA. PROMESA is now what's gotten us in the place that we're in, in Puerto Rico. And they were telling people, we're prepared, but they weren't prepared. By that time, all the municipalities collectively lost $450 million. Two months, no, I'm sorry, six weeks ago, the judge made a ruling that now says for the next 40 years, Puerto Rico has to pay the debt. So the first thing they do, 180 schools are closed in Puerto Rico with another 100 coming. And then people who have housing assistance are losing that. This is exactly what happened in Katrina. The public school system never came back to New Orleans. It's an entire charter system. There is no affordable housing in New Orleans. And the black population has not returned. They want a Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans so they can have a playground. That's what they want. And we cannot let that happen. Naomi Klein wrote Battle for Paradise. She was down there with Elizabeth Yampier, who runs a great organization, a leader in climate justice, Uprose. And she writes this. Earlier this month in San Juan's Ornate Condado Vanderbilt Hotel, the dream of Puerto Rico as a for-profit utopia was on full display. From March 14 to 16, the hotel played host to Puerto Rico, a three-day immersive pitch for blockchain and cryptocurrencies with a special focus on why Puerto Rico will be the epicenter of this multi-trillion dollar market. Among the speakers was Yaron Brook and chair of the Ayn Rand Institute who presented on how deregulation and blockchain can make Puerto Rico the Hong Kong of the Caribbean. Last year, Brook announced that he had personally relocated from California to Puerto Rico paying 55% of his income in taxes to now 4% in Puerto Rico. Elsewhere on the island, hundreds of thousands of Puerto, Rico, Puerto Ricans were still living by flashlights, depending on FEMA for food and aid, and the island's mental health hotline was so overwhelmed with callers who wanted to commit suicide. But inside this conference, there was little space for that kind of downer news. Instead, the 800 attendees, fresh from sunrise yoga and meditation, morning surf, heard from top officials in the Department of Economic Development 
and Commerce Secretary, Secretary Manuel Laboy Rivera about all the things Puerto Rico is doing to turn itself into the new playground for minted cryptocurrency millionaires and billionaires. It's a pitch that the Puerto Rican government has been making to private jets for, to them for a few years now. You don't have to relinquish your United States citizenship or even technically leave the United States to escape its tax laws, regulations, or cold Wall Street winters. You just have to move your company's address to Puerto Rico and enjoy a 4% corporate tax rate, right? Conference attendees also learn that if they move their own resident to Puerto Rico, they will not only be able to surf every morning, but also win vast personal tax advantages. They are calling this pursuit Protopia. They have sent a letter to Carmen Mayor, uh, Mayor Yulín Cruz, uh, the mayor of San Juan, saying they wanted to meet with her because they wanted her to allow them to build this Pretoria kind of place. This was last year. So, you know, and, I mean, Naomi has eloquently talked about disaster capitalism and shock. A lot of the people I know in Puerto Rico are saying it's not a, just a shock doctrine. It's that also we have to always keep in mind that militarily Puerto Rico is very, very important to the United States. So I've been part of a campaign called Our Power PR, New York City. These are the, the demands that we've been making and will continue to be made. I really ask people, especially you know, in places where there's not a lot of Boricuas or Puerto Ricanos, that if you're talking about social justice and not talking about Puerto Rico, you're not talking about social justice. If you're talking about a climate catastrophe and not listening to the people in Puerto Rico that are rebuilding, you're not listening. And we need people to go to Puerto Rico in this way. Go down there and give the organizations the money themselves. Don't give it to the Ford Foundation. Don't give it to George Soros. Don't wait for Lin Manuel Miranda to bring Hamilton. That was, he had movie stars, $10,000 tickets. The people in Puerto Rico are still looking for water at that time. Like, no. We have to support the people who are on the island. They are our leadership. And as Puerto Ricans from the diaspora, a lot of us have had to do that mental check-in, right? Like, I am here, mi gente está aquí, I'm following what they want to do. Okay, um, we're not, we cannot impose anything in Puerto Rico because the young people to me are be, being very innovative, very. There's now younger people that are more comfortable in, in saying I'm um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans. It's still dangerous. In fact, Jose Joe tried to pass a bill a couple of weeks ago to take rights away from LGBTQ Puerto Ricans, but young people are stepping up. People in Louisa are stepping up. You know, um, people are rebuilding. Obviously, we have the project here from Toa Bajo. We need to support. So that's what I can do, and that's what I try to do every day. While here in the States, we're also pushing back. And I'll end with just some of the things we're trying to do through our power PR in New York City. Months after Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico, many Puerto Ricans are still struggling for survival and fighting to remain reclaim and rebuild. Puerto Rican grassroots leaders in New York City have launched the Our Power PR New York City campaign to ensure that emergency response and recovery efforts are informed by a set of principles that will prevent oppressive systems from being replicated on the island. We are calling for the following demands. Drop the debt. Puerto Rico's debt crisis is a direct result of colonialism and austerity policies inflicted on the island by the U.S. government. In order to survive this crisis, Puerto Rico needs full debt relief to focus on emergency response. The only presidential candidate that has taken on these principles and shows the plan for recovery is Elizabeth Warren. Right? 
Now, as I said, I'm not a Democrat. I am not a Republican. I'm a Green Party member. I ran for office. But in this time, I'm crossing party lines to get Elizabeth Warren to be the president. I mean, her plans on everything is, is good. But she's the only candidate that's addressing Puerto Rico before we have to run up on her and shame her to do it, right? Like, she already put the plan out. And part of her plan is a path to independence. And that has to come through the United Nations. Repeal the Jones Act. The Jones Act is unfair, outdated, has delayed relief and increased shipping costs to Puerto Rico. The Jones Act needs to be permanently lifted. Show solidarity and support. Many Puerto Ricans are still without access to power, clean water, fresh and healthy food. We call on the international community to recognize the organizing happening in Puerto Rico by Puerto Ricans and assist with emergency aid by supporting grassroots brigades and the equitable distribution of aid on the ground. Say no to the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act also known as PROMESA. The issue of Puerto Rico's status as a U.S. territory cannot be divorced from emergency response and recovery initiatives. Puerto Rico's status is one of the root causes that left Puerto Rico with a crippling debt and crumbling infrastructure. Push for a just recovery and transition. FEMA is currently pushing policies to promote relocation. This is exactly what FEMA did in New Orleans. If you leave, we'll give you more. If you stay, we won't help you. That's what FEMA has been doing in Puerto Rico. But that's what they did in New Orleans, right? So they want people out of the island for these kind of hedge fund, crypto billionaire dreams. Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rican self-determination and sovereignty to govern resources in harmony with the needs of the people and the earth. Support Puerto Rican climate refugees. Many Puerto Ricans are now being displaced from the island out of necessity, not choice. As Puerto Ricans flee for the island for safety in New York City, in Florida, in Chicago, we must support them in meeting their needs, transitioning to life, and connecting them with local community support resources. And reject the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, but it is treated like a foreign country when it comes to taxes. This tax bill would apply a 20% tariff 20% tariff on imports made in Puerto Rico, and they would also apply to products manufactured by U.S. company subsidiaries borrowing, borrowing for Puerto Rico into further debt. You can find this online by just doing hashtag our power PR in New York City, and I'll end with this quote. We must hold those in power accountable for their crimes. What is happening in Puerto Rico is a crime against humanity that has to be recognized by the entire international world. We must support Puerto Rican organizations on the ground. We must fight for de decolonization and the cancellation of the illegal debt. We must be able to reclaim, rebuild on all terms so that our children can truly be free, free Puerto Ricans in their lifetime. Palante siempre palante. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And, and please support my brothers and sisters that are here right now. You know, they're doing the work, but in a capitalist society, we always need resources. And you know what? Monetary resources are just as good, right? The, you don't need to ship any more goods. There's goods on the port still. The people have been stealing things. Things have rotted. Things haven't been distributed. There is a map online that you could also find where you find a map of Puerto Rico about solidarity, and it tells you all the organizations and where. 
So what we're hoping to do as Puerto Ricans in the diaspora is go as many places and encourage people to adopt an organization to support. Um, one of the organizations that I'm supporting is the Feminist Collective. Um, the violence against women post the hurricane has really gone up. Um, there's been a lot of um, murders or very, uh, um, yeah, murders of women. Um, there's a lot of anxiety. A lot of elderly people are committing suicide. My um, father's best friend, he worked all his life in New York City to retire to Puerto Rico. The hurricane destroyed everything. He got depressed and recently he committed suicide. You know, he was 78 years old and, and there's a lot of trauma and stress. So what I tell everybody is there's enough we can do. Just, it can start as simply as supporting an organization by taking them on doing a monthly or, or yearly donation because we need that. And the more we do it, the more self-sufficient we can become and the more we can fight for Puerto Rico to be independent and not under the choke of colonialism. Thank you so much for having me, everybody.